Welcome to Excerpts from the Open Forum. On this program, we'll hear Mr. Harold Camping answering pre-recorded questions regarding issues from the Bible. Here's our first question. Yes, can you go to Psalm 89, verse 30 to 33? 89, Psalm 89, verse 30 to 33? Yes. All right, in in Psalm 89, if his children forsake my law, this is God speaking now again. Anytime we read the Bible, we're we're hearing words right from the mouth of God Himself. All right, if uh, if uh, His children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments. The word judgment here is a synonym for the law or commandments of God that is walk not in my commandments. If they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Now, that has to be... Uh, we have to look at the rest of the Bible to understand the implication of that and that rod and stripes have to do with coming under the wrath of God. But then we read in verse 33, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Now, that is a very, very encouraging statement. It indicates that God's, uh, God has a plan for this world that will continue to the end of the world. And, uh, and uh, while it, there were uh, times when it almost uh, disappeared, nevertheless, the, the, uh, uh, there's always been believers on this earth. And, and uh, right to the last day now, there are people becoming saved. I see, because at first I thought he was it was saying that uh, if you are a true believer and you're committing sins, that's chastisement he's bringing down just to make you know what you're doing is wrong. Well, this is not what God has in view here. He in in this setup, uh, he is uh, speaking in general about his salvation plan, his salvation plan. Now, we, when we begin to detail God's salvation plan in the life of the individual believer, then we have to look at other verses where God indicates that, yes, you can fall into sin, and God can chastise you and will chastise you, as we read in Hebrews 11. But on the other hand, uh, his, uh, his love will never be taken from us. But this is also... Uh, and this may have an implication for that, but it's also emphasizing that God has a plan that continues to the end of the world. Yes. Thanks. My second question is, um, what are your thoughts about how lately they've been um, interpreting the Bible by using movies? By using movies? Yes. Movies? Like, yeah, like making movies. I think, in a way, in, in describing the Bible. I, I think movies are a terrible, terrible sin when it comes to trying to describe the Bible. The reason I say that is that in a movie, normally uh, there is a plot, there is a, a drama, there is action of one kind or another, and and there are a lot of things introduced that... Uh, did not come out of the Bible. It has to be that way in order to flesh out the uh, the storyline that is being developed. And yet, it's not always possible in the movie to to uh, uh, indicate that this did not come out of the Bible. Now, when a preacher or a Bible teacher is teaching, he can say, you know, this verse may mean this. Or, uh, I, I, as I put this verse with this verse, it appears that this is what God is teaching. And so he is constantly qualifying what he is saying to him so that it, there is a separation, a constant, or there should be a constant separation between 
Uh, this is what God has said. This, when I read this verse, this is God speaking. When I speak about this verse, it is me speaking. And obviously what I say is not as trustworthy by any means as what this verse itself says. But you can't do that with movies and uh, uh, where, for example, they're trying to dramatize who Moses was or what he did or dramatize what Jesus did. Uh, first of all, they're making an image of Christ which is altogether contrary to the law of God. And so all of that is uh, is very sad. My last question is, um, in Matthew 23, verse 31, it explains that God says he will send his angels with a great trumpet to gather his elect. And my question is, um, since in Second Corinthians, it talks about how, um, how Satan comes as an angel of light, if it does happen and when it happens, how will we know if it's really the true angels or false angels? Well, let me tell you, uh, when Christ comes, he will be the archangel himself. He is the ch he's not an angel. That word angel should have been translated messenger. And, he, and with the, the archangel or the, the chief messenger, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not an angel. He's eternal God himself, will come with a shout of command and with the sound of the trumpet. And there will be no question at all. Uh, everyone will know it is Christ. My last question is, um, when you're praying to God personally, does Satan hear what you say? Does Can he actually... Well, like, it, you know, that's a good question. You, uh, if, we, if we're praying out loud, I suppose Satan can hear our prayers. If we're praying in our mind and we're a child of God, we belong to the Lord Jesus... We, Satan has nothing on us. We're not in his kingdom. We're in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been taken out of his dominion. And so he doesn't know what's going on in the mind of a true believer. He doesn't know what we're thinking about. That's, uh, we don't, uh, we, uh, we have no connection with him. So we don't have to worry about that for a moment. created uh, <clears throat> perfect, and after they ate the apple is when they went into sin. Now, if they were created perfect, how could sin be passed on to, to us? If it wasn't in them, how did it pass on to everybody, or was it uh, uh, they were cursed? I take the answer over the air. Be, all right. The, the problem is that all of us were in the loins of Adam. Our bloodline comes from Adam, just like we were in the loins of our great-great-grandpa, and, and then our grandpa, and then our dad, and, uh, and uh, also on our mother's side. We were, we were, uh, we come, uh, our bloodline, our genes all flow from them, and so it goes all the way back to Adam. And when Adam sinned, and become, became corrupted, became uh, inf totally infected with sin, it means all his progeny, everyone that would flow from his bloodline, would also likewise be infected. And the proof of this is, is that we go, we show the evidence of rebellion right from the time that we are born. We, uh, we already are in, in uh, rebellion against God. Oh, yes, um, I have two questions. My first question is, um, if you on the Sabbath day were to celebrate somebody having a baby shower, would that be wrong because you're going to a party? Well, if, it's, if you're going for a baby shower and... Uh, uh, if if it's you're going there because it's an opportunity to witness somehow, that's one thing. Uh, actually, those things ought to try. You ought to try to schedule those on non-Sunday days because uh, it's a, a baby shower. It can just be a time of hilarity and and fun, and is really not getting. And unless unless 
uh, it, you know, birthdays and baby showers and and uh, so on are things where uh, where sometimes we can look at them as an opportunity to share the word with someone. And uh, but uh, we got to be careful. It's 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 the kind of a day where it's a lot safer just not to do it. Okay. And my second question is, my family is in the church, and I know that the Holy Spirit isn't operating in churches anymore. Can they, since they're not going to get saved, of course, in the church, could they get saved just on Friday night, even though they keep going to their church? If they're under, it's continuing in the church. They are, they are, uh, uh, I, I don't know how God works. I know they will not become saved through any activity of that church. A Bible teacher of that church or a pastor of that church or a member of that church uh, witnessing to them, uh, they are not God's holy, God's holy Spirit is totally absent from that. Now, now if you're outside of the church and you're praying for them, uh, uh, can God reach in there and uh, have them driven out somehow? Yes, God can do that. I, I don't. Uh, he has. He's still in charge. But, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's a it's a very very dangerous place where they are. What if it's? Um, I have uh, my nieces and nephews and cousins that regularly go to church because their parents take them to church. Well, join so, the, you see, join the party. The trouble is that we all have loved ones. We come out of a church age, and uh, many of us today uh, were born and raised in a church. And, and so we have families, uh, brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts and you name it, who are, who are uh, uh, members of churches and who don't understand it all. And that's one of the reasons this is a time of great sorrow great sorrow because we know that all these dear ones that we love so dearly and who think that all is well and we know it's not well at all we know that they're in a situation that where there where it's rebellion against god uh, and yet we can't do anything except to pray for them and and uh, try to witness to them as best we can You are listening to excerpts from the Open Forum on Family Radio. Mr. Harold Camping is answering pre-recorded questions about the Bible. If you'd like to hear more of Mr. Camping's teaching, you can hear and even download Open Forum broadcasts, Bible studies, and more. Just go to familyradio.com and click on Audio Archives. Let's continue now with another question. A few callers ago, you were talking about the archangel and how it was Jesus. Um, is it your belief that Michael the archangel is Jesus as well? Michael the archangel is a, an, an incorrect translation. It's Michael the chief messenger, Okay. and Christ is Michael. No question at all about that. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the Jehovah's Witnesses also teach that, and I was wondering how you came to that teaching. Well, excuse me. They teach that Jesus was an angel. They, they, well, they teach, say he's Michael, and that's why they teach that Jesus identifies with Michael. Now they happen right. to have that part of it right, but they're dead wrong in their understanding of whom Jesus was. That does right. not make them correct at all in their understanding of Jesus. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for. And incidentally, uh, you know, sometimes people. Uh, are are nervous when we come to a conclusion that may sound a little bit like a conclusion that some cult or some false teacher has come to. Uh, we don't have to be afraid of that because once in a while a cult or a false teacher can come a little bit close to uh, a truth somewhere along the way, but that doesn't mean that they have truth by any stretch of the imagination. It just means on that one little item, they happen to uh, get a little closer to truth than someone else. But the fact is that uh, we don't have to worry about what the Jehovah Witnesses teach about Christ. We know that Christ is not an angel in any sense at all. The angel was a, 
a created spirit that uh, was altogether different than God himself and Christ is eternal God but he is the the word angel is a in the in the Hebrew is the word malak in the new uh, testament is the word angelus and in both instances it, these are words that uh, can be translated as messengers and a messenger can be an angel a messenger can be a human being a messenger can be uh, God himself Christ is the chief messenger but just because we see the word Malak or Angelus we don't have to jump quickly to the word angel we should it would be far more proper if we first uh, read the word messenger and then looked at the context to discover what messenger is in view is it Christ is it God? Is it a, a human being? Or is it an angel? Hi, Brother Jeffy. How are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. A couple quick questions for you. Have you ever done any study on the two wicked sisters, Ahola and Aholaba, in uh, Ezekiel 22, I believe? Yes. Can you tell me what they spiritually represent? Well, yes. Uh, the Bible tells us who they represent. Uh, Holabah represented, uh, uh, now I, I may get this backwards, but, but one of them represents the ten tribes uh, to the north with their capital in Samaria, which was called the nation of Israel. And the other sister uh, 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 represents uh, Judah, with its capital in Jerusalem, and uh, uh, the the Bible is very very clear about that. Let me let me turn a moment to Ezekiel 23. We read in Ezekiel 23 where God says uh, uh, in in verse four, and the names of them were Ahola the elder and Aholaba her sister, and they were mine, and they bear sons and daughters. Thus were their names, Samaria is Ahola, that would be Israel, the ten tribes, and Jerusalem, that would be Judah, uh, to the south, with the capital in Jerusalem, that was Aholaba. And God is indicating that first Ahola committed adultery with the Assyrians, and then Aholaba came along, that is the nation of Judah, even more adulterously, uh, uh, went into adultery with Babylon, and God destroyed both of them. Okay, and, and my second question, I could take this off the air. Yes. Uh, does the Bible speak to the eternal fate of the unborn? The Bible does not speak to that at all. I'm not aware. I wouldn't know how to answer that question. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, I believe that the Bible is um, the unerring word, the, uh, word of God. Uh, but there's something that puzzles me, um, and I'm hoping you could answer it. it. I don't have the references, but in some parts of the Bible it mentions unicorns. Yes. Okay. Uh, I understand they are mythical creatures. Why are they mentioned in the Bible? Well, uh, the, the word in the Hebrew from which that word unicorn comes is a Hebrew word, but it is uh, translated by the translators as unicorn. Now, why they translated it unicorn, I have no idea. Uh, maybe 400 years ago when they did that translation, because that's when it was done, uh, they thought there was an animal called a unicorn. But the fact is, it is uh, uh, could have been better translated as a wild ox, a wild ox, rather oh. than as a unicorn. Oh. It's a function total of trans totally of translation has nothing to do with the original language. All right. So, what kind of an animal did you say again? Probably a wild ox. A wild ox. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Good evening, Brother Camping. Um, <clears throat> when the Lord Jesus was born in Bethlehem, um, did the, um, <clears throat> how long did it take for the wise men to 
meet up with him. And if they did, uh, was it still in Bethlehem? I'll take it over there, please. Yes. The Bible is very clear that when the uh, Magi came from the east, probably, and this we don't know this for a fact, but probably from Persia, be, uh, and there's various reasons we can uh, 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 give for concluding they were probably from Persia, although not necessarily so, uh, that when they came to Bethlehem at that time, Mary and Joseph and the baby and the young child Jesus were in a house not in the manger any longer. Secondly, on their way coming to Bethlehem, they stopped in Jerusalem uh, because they had understood a king was born, and uh, uh, the king of, of Judea of that day ru uh, ruled in Jerusalem. And uh, there, uh, there uh, uh, the uh, old king Herod, who was very, very jealous and a very wicked king, asked, uh, when did you see the star? And uh, they told him about two years ago. We know that because when Herod later on killed all the babies in and around Judah, uh, Bethlehem rather, because he was trying, he did wanted to make sure that this king, whoever he was, that was born in Bethlehem, would not be alive. Uh, he killed all those up and ar to around two years of age in accordance with the time he had ascertained from the wise men when they saw the star. And so it probably took two years after they saw the star before they arrived in uh, Bethlehem. Now, we must remember, uh, if they came from a distant country, and they did, that we know, uh, uh, and if it were Persia, they came hundreds and hundreds of miles. It was a very, very long trip. Uh, it was very, uh, uh, they needed a uh, very carefully planned a trip because there were lots of bandits on the way. And so they ca probably came with a whole entourage of, of camels and, uh, uh, and uh, soldiers and what have you for protection as well as their gifts that they came, which they gave to uh, the baby Jesus. And, uh, and in planning all of this, it, uh, it is not easy. it's not hard to see how two years could pass very quickly. My question is, what does the word holy mean? And is there a time or place or object that is holy? The word holy in its greatest, uh, de uh, broadest definition means to be set apart. Set apart. And normally as it's used in the Bible, it means set apart for the service of God. That's why we call the Bible the Holy Bible. It's a book set apart uh, for the service of God. Uh, or uh, the true believers are called a holy people. They are set apart for the service of God. It is actually the same word as the, from which we get the word saint. A saint is a, a holy person, as someone who, has been, who is a true believer who has been set apart for the service of God. What about Christmas Day or a sanctuary of a church or angels? Well, now, Christmas Day is, uh, there is no, that's not a holy day in any sense of the word. And, uh, and any church or, or group of people that try to make Christmas Day a holy day is they're doing without any biblical sanction of any kind. Uh, the Bible does not speak about Christmas Day as a holy day. Uh, uh, and secondly, the sanctuary uh, we could call that a, a during the church age there was a room in a in a church building that we sometimes called the sanctuary that was set apart by man really not by God but by man and dedicated to the proclamation of the gospel but uh, it did not mean that intrinsically that now has become a holy room of some kind how are angels holy well, the, because a true, uh, a, uh, holy, that is a, uh, the angels that have not fallen into sin. There were angels that, that rebelled against God and became devils. 
or fallen angels, but the true uh, believers or the, the, those that have not fallen into sin are called holy because they are set apart for the service of God. We read about them in Hebrews chapter 1 where it describes in verse 13 or 14 that they have been created uh, to serve God in his work of salvation. What about communion bread? I'm sorry? Communion bread? The communion and, well, we, bread. we, we uh, that ceremonial law, we call that a holy, uh, that is set apart, but we, the church uh, historically has done way more with that than that they should have. They. Uh, it is true that it is a, a sign that God instructs us to place before the congregation, and in that sense it is holy, but, it, uh, but uh, there's all kinds of spiritual uh, substance that has been built into the idea of the bread and the wine or the bread and the grape juice that is absolutely not there at all.